You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veteran, etc. This is a show focused on veteran readjustment culture, not just veteran culture. We don't just look at books, movies, TV shows, podcasts, and other expressions of the veteran reality uh, from the military reality in a limited way. We expand and create multiple meanings. We know that there are intersubjective, interpersonal realities that exist in dealing with veteran issues, veterans themselves, and I call the spirit of the veteran moment. That's where we're at now as we have completed 20 years on the war on terror and we're in this new state of being where we can all universally call ourselves veterans how that we've served. That doesn't mean that there aren't those serving. That doesn't mean that there aren't those who served in a war and are still serving. But right now, what veterans share in common is that we are at a time of peace in regards to our country being at war. This episode deals with military entertainment. That is the question. This is an audio essay, and let me begin by saying that in no way do I promote canceling uh, any type of military veteran literature that is not harmful to self or others. I also encourage people to read for themselves, listen for themselves, view for themselves. That's right. So if I ever mention a certain podcast or a certain book or a certain movie, I'm feeling some kind of way about it, it's okay. And it's okay for you to feel some kind of way with the things that I say, with my shows, with my narrative. But all of this does not prevent us from being at this age, this veteran moment, this spirit of veteran life, of daily life, that includes not just our relationships as veterans with our families and our friends and comrades who served in uniform, but we can choose to be connected to the many artifacts, expressions of art and science and writing, the humanities, social sciences, hard sciences that involve veterans and the military. I don't have a narrow view on this. I also open it up to the question of military entertainment. Why? Because I think that it doesn't take a war on terror to recognize that there have been books and movies and radio shows and magazines that have dealt with war the military, and the veteran reality. Let's look at the epic Greek Homeric pieces that all throughout society, that ancient society, pretty much remembered the stories word by word. And the warrior lives had many different meanings, not just one meaning. And it also had an expression of entertainment. So yes, even Odysseus, spoke about, or I should say, those who wrote about Odysseus spoke about the type of life he lived in and out of war. Sadly, we limit ourselves to thinking of war as just something out of Saving Private Ryan or seeing the movie Platoon or Full Metal Jacket 
or the sands of Iwo Jima. We cannot, in many ways, critically look at these pieces without also looking at Stephen Crane's book, The Red Badge of Courage. That was circulating throughout Civil War generation and beyond. But a lot of people, they do not see that Crane was never in the military. And so for me, this book, even children read and are warned about in regards to war and its horrors. Well, can we even have questions regarding the venerated piece as well as the venerated author? I think we all who write, speak, perform in the veteran terrain do not need to just rely on our yellow ribbon that society has given us, the societal pass to say whatever we want, perform and do whatever we want without any boundaries. I call for a boundary in regarding ethic in our conduct. Just like we have a conduct of war, we could have a conduct of how veterans readjust. And part of that is truly examine the things we put out regarding the military war and the veteran existence. What are we saying about veteran care? Do we really have the, the background to talk about veteran care? And we just show up on a podcast from Joe Rogan, who hasn't done search himself about the issue. And information is shared in many ways. And in many ways, it's incomplete information and also misinformed at times. And so when millions of civilians and veterans are exposed to this, what type of obligation do we have as veterans to society? You see, this war on terror introduced this veteran-civilian divide. Uh, well, it could be found in New York Times, in different books that you read. And it seems as though veterans certain veterans are writing about this divide and also about the what ifs, the counterfactuals. Like, what if we had the right leadership? What if we had the right strategy to win in Iraq and in Afghanistan? I think those are adequate questions. At the same time, there are other questions to ask. There are many questions to ask about the wars that we're a part of, the ways we've been affected by war, the way we have impacted our presence, or how could I say it, the impact of our presence in a war zone. How are we represented as warriors? How do we represent ourselves in the war zone? How do we represent ourselves back home to society? How authentic is it? Is it a way of life to receive all the, how could I say, praise, likes, and opportunities tied to the representations? Well, if it is, that's okay. But unlike what Tim O'Brien wrote, yes, the Vietnam War veteran author Tim O'Brien wrote the things they carry. And it's 2023. And I wonder if we all as veterans can also say the things we unpacked and the things we are unpacking now. O'Brien wrote an article about the war story and questioning morality about that, that I guess from my interpretation, it's no true war story is moral. I would say in disagreement that everything we do in a war zone is moral. Now, I mentioned this veteran civilian divide it's become a spectacle. In previous times, warriors would come back and they would just readjust. They would take opportunities that society would offer and readjust and not create a spectacle, as in, let's say, what Guy Debord, the philosopher, spoke about in his book, Society of the Spectacle, or is it Spectacle of Society? I think it's the former. Now, war seems to be, and readjustment seems to be the spectacle in itself, the priority. 
the story, things like the veteran civilian divide, things like how in our care for veterans is at the VA hospital, the things like, well, everyone needs to have a gun. I don't know if these are truths or, or myths, but I do know that it's important to make distinctions and it's important to look at our sources. When we claim certain universal things tied to civilian veteran relations, veteran readjustment, and just how the re representations of veterans are circulating. I started to be part of a workshop, a writing workshop at NYU, New York University. There was money funded, I believe, from the Kennedy family, and it was a veteran writing workshop. And many well-known Iraq war veteran authors came out of that workshop. Phil Clay, Roy Cranton, Matt Gallagher, and several others. Let me leave Matt out of this because I feel as though when it comes to an authentic voice about war, I make the distinction that Matt Gallagher's voice regarding war is not privileged, but it's ethical. It's an ethical voice coming out. It's ethical because there's parts of the self shared in a deep way about war. I have a problem, though, with some of the works by Roy Scranton and Phil Clay. War Porn and the book Redeployment. These, these, these books and others are, to me, not to be banned, but I question the ethics in regards to, let's say, in redeployment, what type of ethical message is coming out with the story in Vietnam, we had whores. So Clay, you know, to be fair, does not spend a lot of time trashing Vietnamese women. But at the same time, his book is very powerful. And my son could get access to that book because it's the book of the year in 2014. I'd rather have my son read the 2015 book of the year written by Tanhasi Coat, The Beautiful Struggle. Why Coates? Well, Coates truly in a smart way and in an ethical way and in a sad way and in a fun way, describes his war as a black man and as a black boy in the streets of West Baltimore during the crack epidemic and during welfare reform. I'd want my son to have this book because a dear professor of mine at Columbia University, Dr. Joseph Nelson, well, he recommended it. At first I thought, gosh, this book is just some mass media attention filled. But when I read it, I really felt ta Coates's pilgrimage from inner city Baltimore to Howard University. And that would be something that I would want my son to read in his middle school library. Why I would have problems with Clay's book, Redeployment, is that I, and that's just me, I don't see much of the author sharing his vulnerability regarding war. I think when you talk about war, I do think there should be some level of vulnerability, some level of humility. It's not like you're writing, you're trying to be Albert Camus. You're not, through your characters, I believe it's problematic when I hear a certain proportional distance from that reality of war and the mind of the author. And I find that in redeployment. I mean, even the reviews on this book missed this story in the book. In Vietnam, we had whores. I mean, in reality, all wars, sex workers. That's the reality. Poverty will create that. And sadly, the poverty in a war zone 
will create that. Why was not that happening in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, I think commanders did do the right thing in stressing a certain level of morality in regards to the treatment of the old, the young, and women. I'm not saying that these folks were not affected by the war, but I can say that out of all the wars the United States has been involved in, this last war made an effort to pay attention to the needs of those who we occupied. And that does not justify our occupation, not at all. But I think there needs to be credit in regards to the effort of making dark ethical actions in many ways and in many times less than ethical environment. I'm caught up in the moment right now because I'm thinking about my stepmother, who's Vietnamese, who married a Vietnam veteran who committed suicide and had a lot of problems, who beat her and mistreated his family. I'm thinking about the suffering this woman, my stepmother, experienced in the Vietnam War and how my broken father from the Korean War made an ethical effort to help her as she was prematurely dying of Parkinson's disease due to what we believe the exposure of Agent Orange while she was in Vietnam. I can't help but to think about the Asian women and other women who've been objectified in wars because women have suffered in all of the wars, whether they served in uniform or whether they were civilians. My mother, when the United States invaded the Dominican Republic in 1965, experienced the condone bombing raids on the Dominican coastline near my mother's house. It's ironic because when my mom died of cancer, she wasn't talking about the pain that she was having, the physical loss, the existential loss. She was talking about her war trauma and hiding underneath the bed when she was young due to war. So I think that when we write about war, about the military, when we perform our plays, when we paint things tied to war, I think there needs to be special care. It's like being a war trauma therapist. It's like being me. I spent many, many years treating those who suffered from war. And I can honestly say that in every case I took on, I put special care into that case. While there is no perfection in our work, what should be perfect is the effort to make things right with those we represent, those who are tied to the stories that are used to heal or to inform. Terry Entertainment, not just a John Wayne movie, Sands of Iwo Jima, as I said earlier. You can learn a lot about that through Roger Stahl's book, Militate Inc. Stahl is a professor at University of Georgia and um, has pointed out that besides the citizen soldier and the soldier, what has these wars produced, especially during this war on terror, it's produced in mass the citizen spectator. Because in this war, very few people, let's just say, have skin in the game. Military entertainment definitely existed during World War II. But there was skin in the game because your husband, your son, your, your daughter, your nurse corps, etc., were deployed in the Pacific or in Europe or in Africa. We don't have that now in regards to our citizen spectator reality. I wouldn't say it's an issue of the veteran-civilian divide and the lack of 
young kids not serving in the military as the problem, I point to the spectacle and those who create the spectacle, not just the writer or the performer or the poet, but in the organizations tied to nonprofits to help veterans. For example, in my opinion, Iraq veterans against the war and warrior writers and wounded warrior project. These organizations are also fueling militainment and a certain type of military entertainment that's about providing limited narratives, but maximum profits. How do I know? Well, you just need to Google Wounded Warrior Project and you'll find the many stories regarding the financial issues that they've had throughout the years, the challenges. In regards to Iraq veterans against the war and warrior writers, well, let's just say when I returned from Iraq, there was a predatory spirit within those organizations, those groups, where they even took my address and my personal information and on a grant application, put me down as their executive director and use my address without my consent. This is the type of predatory behavior that is tied to the negative aspects of military entertainment. And there's many other expressions of negative military entertainment, this militainment. When we see network news tied to veteran issues and the spectacle, the spectacle hides the profits, just like the spectacle of the stories with warrior writers and all the demonstrations from Iraq veterans against the war. That spectacle, all of that hides, that's the smoke screen, it hides the donations, the activities that are tied, not just what's out there in the public, but behind the scenes. I'm, I'm not saying that all of these nonprofits for vets are bad. There are many uh, great ones, and I've been attached to some of them. I think that there needs to be a level of accountability done by society and fellow veterans. We must hold each other accountable, and we need not have the spectacle of the yellow ribbon be the military entertainment that hides the appropriate services, the appropriate care, the important lives, the distinct lives, the voices that aren't heard regarding war. Those voices like my sister, combat veteran, Afghanistan. She's a mother of three and was deeply affected by her war experience. But that's a different narrative as to my narrative. And I think narratives like hers need to be circulated. And they need not be circulated as a way to generate more entertainment, but more into truth, more into recognizing the different layers of meaning. The ethics of the veteran voice, it always comes back to what is that veteran getting out of sharing that voice of war, of military, and who's managing the audience for that? So when Joe Rogan has his shows and he has all of these superstar vets, and believe me, there's no jealousy there. I actually find it admirable. I'm a big fan of David Goggins, but I think we have to pay attention to the platforms tied to these warrior voices. Politician, in Washington, D.C., like Dan Crenshaw, having all kinds of access to power, a noble veteran Navy SEAL while he was in the military, admirable in combat, far beyond me. But as a veteran, when he speaks and he minimizes the narratives of others when talking about veteran compensation or talking about military disability retirement, this is a limited voice about a very complex end of issues. And we as the public 
need to be watchful. I'm not saying to cancel, but I'm saying to be watchful. We can be watchful and also look at other voices that are also talking about the warrior life, like civilians, like Akbal Hosman out of the Turkish Journal of Scientific Research. I love looking at academic research done in other countries far from the West. I also enjoy reading research studies from the West. But I like I like the daring articles, especially by Alasman, who makes us think about military entertainment in many ways with his writings. It's interesting. He mentions the post-heroic. Are we at that age where we're using military entertainment as a way to fill our sense of heroism? When veterans write stories like, in Vietnam, we had whores, is that a psychoanalytic message that can be broken down as far as if I only experienced a war? Now, I am not saying that the author and authors of these type of pieces are and were not affected by war. I'm not saying uh, they weren't heroes. They could have been very well heroes. But when you're a public affairs officer in the Marine Corps, that's very different than being an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. This is not a pissing contest, but it's pointing out distinctions so that we can look at the voices coming out of the different expressions of military entertainment. I mean, is it all that, and I even find myself in this, I wish I had experienced the extreme combat that my father experienced in Korea. Do these, do these other veterans, in many ways, they write about people like Paul Fussell, the World War II veteran who has a certain sense of masculinity in his writings, wartime, understanding and behavior in the Second World War, written in 1989. Again, I don't knock the book. I'm just trying to understand what are uncommon understandings coming from this book. In the book, you find the word chicken shit used. Actually, the term is used in World War I. But I think we as veterans, not just those who I've talked about, include me in this. We're all seeking experiences that others who lived before us in war experience in many ways. We want a certain type of language that sticks. We want our war movies to stand out from our war. We want our war to be real to ourselves. And I think that's why we've focused so much inner energy to share our wars, our military service with others. I only ask, and I even ask myself, am I being ethical in doing that? Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out ComingHomeWell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.